By the end of March last year, I was like you are now, sitting behind my computer, and what I was about to discover would change mine and many others' lives for the months to come. The pandemic had just hit Sweden. In the news, they were talking about shortages of protective equipment for medical workers. And it was clear that this was a crisis that none of us had prepared enough for. Being a maker and inventor, my reaction was to go looking for solutions. And what I found there, sitting behind my screen, was two things. First, a fellow maker here in Stockholm had designed a face shield that could be printed by anyone with a 3D printer and released the designs open to the public. Then a 3D printer farm started to grow at the Stockholm makerspace. People brought their machines to the space and volunteers worked in shifts managing them. They printed as much as was physically possible and delivered to healthcare workers. Now this really impressed me. The whole process of uh, going from problem to solution, from idea to factory, in only a few days. It was like oh, something almost magical was happening here. At this time, I was uh, doing my last week at the National Museum for Science and Technology. I was working as a maker educator, mostly teaching kids how to uh, design, build and program funky little robots. Uh, we had just started making a makerspace in the museum. So I cranked up the 3D printers and started printing the face shields to contribute with what little I could. But I felt I wanted to do more. And this led me to designing an alternative version of the face shield, one that I thought could be made much faster using a laser cutter machine instead. This was also a good opportunity for me to dive in to my enthusiastic nerdiness in the wonderful world of machines, while also doing something that felt really meaningful. I had access to an old laser cutter through my membership in a place called Blivande, where I usually spend time making art installations. This house, Blivande, it's a, it's a creative hub, a co-working space, for a broad variety of uh, people, including welders, uh, programmers, artists, and, and many, many more. Uh, being this center for participatory art, people here are, are used to crossing boundaries and acting in independent environments, free from strong hierarchies. Everyone just does things and uh, it becomes what it becomes. One of those places where pretty much anything can happen and you never really know what to expect except for the unexpected. And this would turn out to be essential features for what was about to come next. Late one evening, Hampus stopped by to ask me what I was doing. He's my old friend and co-founder of Blivande. We have a chat about what more we can do, if we can involve more people, and how to help with the crisis together. A few moments after this, while again sitting there behind the screens, we stumble upon the second solution. Another team at the uh, Stockholm Makerspace had made a pattern for a medical gown. And they also released the designs and the patterns and instructions open for anyone to use. We spent the next day making an improved version of the template. This one we cut out from a large sheet of uh, thin wood with, using a jigsaw. And it, this one worked even better. After spending one more day setting up workstations, we sent out invitations to people to come in and work in the impromptu gown factory. And over the next few days, volunteers joined, the production line was improved, and the small factory was extended from one to three rooms with a staff of around five to ten people working each shift. What is interesting here, and absolutely crucial, is that a system started to emerge. A system in which some took responsibility in the form of production line managers. And soon others joined and worked only with distribution, while others starting to assess the needs of local healthcare centers so that we could prioritize our deliveries to where we needed the most. And in a few days' time, from being only two people improvising on a sudden idea, we'd grown into a small working factory providing local healthcare 
with personal protective equipment. Now this was nothing that was planned in any theoretical way. It pretty much just seemed to happen by itself, by people just showing up and taking initiatives they saw would improve their collective effort, and without asking for permissions first. People of all ages, nationalities and backgrounds were showing up to volunteer in the gown factory. Some came in to cook food for everyone, uh, some donated money, a bicycle, access to car and production materials. And one lovely person donated a huge amount of really delicious cheese. And then we have this guy called Jens. Jens, he came in and spent the day working in the gown factory. And the next day, he had found a new location. Assembled a team, copied our system, and was waved off outside of Blivande with a trailer packed with a starter kit. Just a day later, the new factory had opened up. And it did not stop there. Gown factories were now popping up in multiple locations all around the country, following the same patterns of mimicking what was already happening elsewhere. A small team of initiators gathered in a group for national decentralized coordination. Here we shared designs, systems, routines, challenges and solutions openly among each other throughout the duration of the initiative which lasted until the beginning of June last year. At this time, the real factories and industries were catching up. And with a production capacity many orders of magnitude larger than us, our efforts in this were no longer needed. And by the end of it all, Blivande crisis response had, in collaboration with our sister factories in Sweden, produced and distributed over 200,000 gowns and well over 100,000 3D printed face shields. And we were not alone. All around the world, people got together to solve the challenges that the pandemic had brought with it. One initiative that stands out in this international collaboration is the Open Source Medical Supplies Network. They made a map of production facilities that emerged during the crisis. And in January this year, they published a report on the open source maker and manufacturer response to the COVID-19 personal protective equipment crisis. According to the report, over 50 million items were produced through thousands of initiatives like ours from over 80 countries. And of course, there are many, many more that have not been reached by or participated in this report. All across the world, these initiatives became a deeply meaningful place for people to stay active and constructive during times of isolation and fear. And I think we are all really grateful for the opportunity to help and thankful to have been part of a movement that will forever give us warm memories from a time of crisis. Now all of this taken into account, we know a lot more than we knew before the pandemic. We know that local, national and international open source collaboration will happen. We know that civil society will rise up to the challenges at hand and provide unexpected solutions. We also know that there are challenges to this type of phenomenon. Spontaneous factories popping up did not seem to fit the models of what the formal societal and governmental structures had the capacity to incorporate. During the crisis response, there was, in our experience, a large gap between civil society and government structures. And none of us knew how to really work with the other. Regulatory obstacles that seemed absurd in the context of the crisis were seen stopping or limiting the help offered by civil society and industry alike until they were eventually removed. This situation was of course a really complex challenge for decision makers, industry, bureaucrats and self-organizing civil society, all being understandably overwhelmed by the situation at hand. How could we better integrate these different sectors cultures and governance models? I don't know yet. 
But let us not underestimate the potential of the spontaneous and self-organizing civil society providing solutions to local, regional and global problems throughout open source methods and mass collaboration. We have yet only scratched the surface of what's possible in self-organizing co-creative civil society initiatives like these. And throughout the recent decades, we humans have gained tremendous abilities to self-organize in new ways. Our networks of communication channels makes it possible to find each other faster than ever before and to organize faster than ever before. New models, principles and methods of how to do this have grown. And with that, people and whole communities. Spearheaded by open source movements, virtual initiatives like the Wikipedia, Linux and the Creative Commons, and non-virtual ones like the Maker Movement, Burning Man Communities and the self-organized civil society crisis response all have some things in common. Some ideas that can suddenly bring thousands or millions of people together from all over the world working towards a common purpose. A set of rough principles rigid enough to enable all this. Principles such as open and transparent there are no hidden agendas and no secret documents. Participatory and voluntary. Everyone is invited to participate in whatever way they want to contribute. Immediate. Seeing oneself and each other for who we are and how we can grow from this moment instead of who we used to be or what our job titles are or what we study to do. Duocratic. Everyone is invited to make decisions and to make, take action without asking for permission first. Responsible. Taking into account who is affected by our actions and involving them in the decision making. Giving. Doing things that will improve upon others' lives and experiences, be it strangers or dear friends, but without expecting anything in return. Now, these are principles and not rules. And of course, this does not solve everything. But it is a pattern of a significant new power to behold in our world. Something that lives parallel to government, corporate and traditional structures. The power for anyone to start a mass movement with strangers out of nothing. During the coming century, we humans and most life forms living alongside us will face dire challenges. Challenges that our established systems are not made to handle. This might seem like a frightening message to many of us. But the systems are only ever a limited resource in solving any crisis. The rest is up to you and me, even in the times where no one is asking for us to do anything. So for everything that you have done, and everything that you will do to help others that was not required of you, but you did it anyway. Thank you.